must face the fire of the dark sun. As another day rises on the magic ravaged world of Athas. A great dry breeze sweeps across the sea of silt and heat. Heat as you have never known, even living on the godless world, rises from the desert up the foothills to the city of Tyr. But you are not the type to ever go into the cities of mulls and men. No, you stick to the wastelands where the three cream defilers are known to dwell. You seek the obsidian citadel. What? You know nothing of Athos? You've never faced the fire of the dark sun, the world ravaged by sorcery? Then, join me, defiler. Join me, Templar of the Sand. And I will tell you of Dark Sun. No! <laughs> Ant-Man. Greetings, programs. It's Hanker and Fernell. Welcome back to another awesome episode of Runehammer, where we're going to play D&D. &D. We're going to play it just as good as we can. Just mo best. It's going to be the mo best D&D you're ever going to play. All right. Wow. I'm stoked. I'm so psyched I had to put on my, my Athasian Barbarian gloves. We are talking about my all-time favorite box set in D&D. Way back in the second edition days, Dark Sun. Dark Sun. I mean, yes. Lately, uh, the, the worlds that WotC has been rejuvenating or sort of reissuing for Dungeons & Dragons have obviously been Faerun, Faerun, and uh, Sword Coast, which is fair on. And, uh, anyway, what I find myself saying is, man, 5th edition, Dark Sun, yes, that would be cool. And then, wait a minute, why? Why do we need 5th edition Dark Sun? We've got Dark Sun. It's right there. So you can get this box set on Amazon. There's lots of sellers that still have it uh, around with all the components intact. You know, some things from back in the day... You think like, oh man, Transformers were so cool, how we used to, used to watch Transformers all the time. Then you go watch Transformers and it's like barely watchable. It was just nostalgia, right? Not the case with Dark Sun. Dark Sun stands the test of time. And that is the reason for this video, because of how brilliant this little piece of creative magic is in the whole scope and cosmos of D and D. Before we get like all the way into it, this whole discussion, because I know I'm just going to start going like Matt Colville speeds here and just being like, "No, I love Dark Sun." Before we get all into that, let's take a look at what you actually get in the box set. So, if you're thinking about getting into Dark Sun and bringing it into your game, you get an exact sense of what you're getting in the box set. So let's uh, let's roll that beautiful beam footage. Hit it. All right. So let's take a look inside this awesome box set, arguably one of the greatest box sets of all time in D&D. So when you open up your Dark Sun box, the first uh, book you're going to see is probably going to be the Wanderer's Journal. So it's described as lands and people of Athas, the world of Dark Sun. And so what you're going to get is some story, some locations, the history, the races, uh, some of the sort of character archetypes and classes. There's lots of text, as you can see. Oh, this part is great about the Sea of Silt. So instead of an ocean, there's just this massive sea of super fine dust that uh, gets deep in spots, can be weighted in, has islands and so forth. But you can see this is kind of dense, right? I mean, there's a lot of text here and uh, occasional art, mostly uh, by Brahm which is so fantastic and so flavorful and cool and then goes into the cities and those are all really detailed and I could see really being useful and that's about that you've also got your monsters here in the back um, the best one is what what's it called the desert freak I love that guy your your sense of where you are who you're encountering and why okay so that's your your first book there then the next one you've got is the sort of the guts of it, which is the rules book. Okay, the, the rules book is the rules for your classes, um, you know, how to build and progress your characters. Uh, there's a great magic section. 
Um, so I'm not, I'm not really here to flip through everything for you because you're going to get this box set. But this is a little uh, lighter and more fun to move through. You've got a little more art. There's some more tables. It's not just, you know, this kind of lore dump, which is the sort of mean word for, um, you know, a campaign book. This is your player's handbook right here. You got all your loot and everything. Good stuff. This is a really nice little player's handbook. I mean, it's that big. So this is very manageable and easy to absorb. Now, you might not be playing second edition D&D, but D&D is so timeless and so easy to comprehend and easy to convert. I, I wouldn't worry about what edition it is. It, you'll see how simple and how um, consistent d and d has been over the years that it just it's going to convert into whatever you're playing so there's your your real guts book your rules book we're saving those other two items these guys for last so we'll get those at the end okay now you get into the the maps and so dark sun comes with two big maps one is the region of tear which these things are huge too they're like i don't know 36 by 24 or so so you get a big old map and then you also get the hex version of that map, if you're doing like, you know, tracking how many supplies it takes to cross the desert and stuff like that. So you get that map. Then, in addition to that, you get the city of Tyr. So if you actually go to the capital where King Kalak is and all that sort of the primary storyline of the dragon and all this kind of stuff. How Athos fell, how it was relinquished by the gods and so forth. Or not so much relinquished as forsaken. Let me, there we go. So you get this big, so I don't really use city maps so much in my my games, but I could see if you were doing like maybe a, a little bit of an intrigue session or you were doing maybe like a wagon chase or maybe you were, a dragon was actually laying waste to the city. That could be cool. Next you have a short story that comes in separate form. And, and I love how they, in the old days, used to do these boxes with the separate little packets because you could kind of sit down on the couch with just this or have this in your backpack and you don't have to always take you know all the materials around because you just want to read the short story so this is the short story that goes with the adventure and then this is just if you guys are you know bought old school box sets you know how they would always come with a little catalog and little promo cards and stuff like that the real gem that you get is this adventure a little knowledge now as an adventure it's great it, it introduces you to dark sun but it's how they deliver the adventure to you that I really wish would have stuck around in D&D. I love how they deliver the adventure to you. I mean, it's an adventure a lot like others. You move through some different locations. There's a little bit of combat. There's a story that unfolds. And again, I'm not here to reveal all that data to you. That's not the, the thrust of this video. It's more the creative standard and method that they use to deliver this adventure is what I just am so excited about and love so much and always what I held as a standard. Um, so the way they give you the adventure is in these two books. This is player aids and this is for the DM. Okay, so the DM is the easy one, right? You go in, it's a setup for the adventure, the basic story, kind of what you're gonna do. Like I love these little bullets like what the guards know, that's something I can really process. And then each page in this is this really thick card stock and it's on a spiral binder. Like these details all matter because you're probably going to be on this page for a while. And it takes up very little table room. It folds over and lays flat. It's both sided, so you get a lot out of your real estate. And you're right here. Like, this is where you're going to be in, like for an hour of gameplay. And then here. And then here. And it's just so tight with stats and the basics of what you need to know. And little tiny descriptive bullets to get you in the moment and be able to describe it to players and look it's just dense here you got like so we're finally going to do a little dungeon and again i don't want to reveal all of what uh, a little knowledge is about the adventure because that's for you to find out when you get dark sun but you know, this is just this is how you would describe your dungeon and then look it has these tight little stat blocks on some monsters like this is how i work out of a journal only they're making a journal for you and it's just the the creative awesomeness here cannot be overstated it just feels so i don't know the word it feels so real it really does feel like playable material rather than like 
Here's a giant book with stuff in it that kind of forms like a, some kind of behemoth story. Good luck making this into actual play. Okay, so on the other side, this is the Dungeon Master book. On the other side, you have the player aids. Now, I didn't even realize it, but I think subconsciously this hugely informed my index card method that I use. So look, it's just a, a flip spiral of visual aids that the players are going to be looking at while you play. Now you guys know how I feel, like having visual aids gives your players what I call the campfire effect. It gives you something to look at while you play. Now look at this, this is brilliant. It comes with this little fold out cardboard insert so that it can stand just like that. So while you're playing, you can stand this at your table and then you're playing, you know, down here, you know, you got your dice down here and you're playing down here and you got your minis and stuff. But you're, you get one really cool piece of thematic art with the dark sun on top and stuff that can bring the imagination back again and again. And the art, by the way, between Braxit and Brahm is bloody awesome. I mean, especially if you're like me and you really like black and white ink art, this is, this is really good stuff. It's so cool and so flavory. So see, it's like there's an encounter with this silkworm, right? Which is one of the monsters on Athos, And it's in this, this camp at night. And so with the insert, you can stand this on your table and you have this super sick piece of art to kind of drive home the descriptions and the action as you're playing. Very real straight to the table stuff. Oh, I love this guy, the, the three cream sorcerer. Um, and so if you have a big boss fight with this three cream sorcerer, you have this guy, you pop out your little insert, and there you go. Now you might have your mini on the table for your sorcerer and you're doing your boss battle and everything, but you have this thematic piece of art that stands on your table that gives this feeling of like, guys, we're playing. Now, now back in these days, at least for me, I didn't use terrain. We just had a dry erase board. So having this stuff was so cool. And then also kind of back then worshiping these artists, you know, it's just like, oh, you could just look at this piece for ages and it's just so cool. So that's the player aid section. And they pretty much go punch for punch with each other. So they're, you can see they're kind of comparable. So it's like, you know, thing, 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 and they match up in a way that's very easy to run the adventure. And this right here is worth what you're gonna pay to get your Dark Sun box set, just to get this. Not only just to run this as a dungeon master, but to see how the thinking uh, worked here. The way that Troy Denning dreamed up Dark Sun shows, I think, the best. The novels are cool too, but it's just right here, it's such a dense little nugget of joy. Okay, so that's all the stuff in the box, right? And the awesomeness of how that adventure is delivered through these big baller visual aids, right? Oh my God, he's that big. I'm just gonna use the book as a miniature. Why is Dark Sun so enduring? I mean, part of it is that D&D had never really had an alternate world. And I don't mean like, you know, Forgotten Realms versus Greyhawk. That does not count as alternate. Greyhawk was just a slightly different tone. It was a little higher and a little more noble tone. It, it really was, in my mind, not a true alternate. Now, people who were playing other games back in the day were already in weirder worlds. It's just to see Dark Sun show up in D&D &D, and then to see the talent level that came with the first Dark Sun box was just awesome to people playing other stuff. Like, at this time, I was playing Rifts, and we were playing Palladium, Fantasy Hero, and we're kind of playing just homebrew craziness, right? So not only did we get a new, like, very alternate, very different, very complete mind thread over here world when Dark Sun came out, it's Troy Denning and Brahm put together, I think, are what makes it so stinking magic. Now, if you don't know who those people are, do your homework immediately. Troy Denning is the key writer behind Dark Sun. And I think designer as well. He also wrote the five, I think there's five Dark Sun novels, which are awesome because he, for whatever reason, I don't know if he did it over the course of years or if he just like his brain broke and he just wrote all this awesome Dark Sun stuff, but it all has a very consistent tone and it's a unique tone and it's a fully visualized tone. It's not thin. As Dark Sun, and as Mike Merles put it, uh, what 
last week or so on Twitter, he called Dark Sun a masterclass in world building. And that was part of why I wanted to get this video going. Now, I had already gotten a bunch of my stuff together and like made my poster and everything when I saw that tweet. So I was just like, yes, Mike Merle's brain is vastly larger than mine. And at least one tiny portion of it is occupied with the same thing I'm thinking about. So that, that's cool, right? Dark Sun. So on the one hand, you have Troy Denning, the writer. Brilliant and out there. Go out there. And this is something that, you know, you guys know me. I'm all about don't be like anything. Just just go out there. Just shoot out there. Don't remake. Don't imitate. Don't, just, just go. And he did with Dark Sun. Now, that was only half of the team up. The other half is Gerald Brom. Brom is the key artist behind Dark Sun. He's the guy that did this. And this is not Photoshop. This is like oil paint. <laughs> but Brom also has become, since Dark Sun, a hugely influential artist. And you actually probably know a lot of Brahms' influence and artwork. You just don't know that it's all the same guy. He's hugely prolific and has a very specific and amazing style that's this, like, Archon style that has found its way into games, comic books, and film. And once you start to, you know, go on the Google wormhole that is Brahm, you're going to see not only how Dark Sun is his visual sort of creation, but also then Brahm went on since Dark Sun to create all this other amazing stuff. Um, I'm not going to get into every little detail because that's the fun of you doing the homework. But Brahm brought this level of art to D&D. And for me, at that time, a lot of the art in the RPGs that I was playing was not to this level. And that's why I think also this box cover, everyone knows this box cover. It's really iconic. It's really says a lot about what's going to be inside. As a way to twist your campaign in a new direction, I think it's absolutely sort of underappreciated, and that's why I'm here to preach the gospel, right? The gospel of a world without gods. Blah. Now that you kind of know why I'm excited about it, you've seen the contents, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of what Dark Sun is sort of about, what the gist is, okay? It's a planet that has been, by hook or by crook, wound up in a bit of a pocket dimension, and in this pocket dimension there are no gods. Now there's more detail to it, but there are no gods. And so that's sort of one of the fundamental pillars. The second one is that magic is become a bit overpowered on Athos because of the absence of the gods. And for this reason, magic is actually drawing the life out of this planet. And it's left this planet, like this ravaged wasteland, a very like 90s heavy metal style wasteland, right? Which is like, yeah. So it isn't a post-apocalyptic wasteland because that's like where urban civilization has fallen. This is where like a fantasy civilization has sort of been wiped desolate. It's not like they blew themselves up or like a plague turned them into zombies or something. No, magic has literally drawn the life force out of this planet. So it's this huge, dead, waterless planet. There are other elements that then come with the ramifications of a big desert planet, like insects. There's a lot of insect themes in Dark Sun, and this is the uh, the origin of the Three Cream. You have deserty insect themes, and then you also have sort of the races have been made worse, right? So you have a half dwarf, half man race called the Mulls, and they're like these pit fighter types. Like I think that's what this guy is supposed to be. And then for classes, you have Templars, which is Clerics with no gods become elemental. And the I really like the spell section in the Dark, uh, the Dark Sun book because it's, it's spells that you're going to recognize. It's not like all these wild spells like in Simba Room or something, but they're organized in a way. Uh, the clerics, I think it's called spheres. So they, they have like elemental driven powers. And so the spells have been nicely organized into these elemental spheres. And I know that isn't like some kind of stroke of genius, but just looking at the book and thinking about character customization, it feels awesome. Then on the wizard side, the defiler is the wizard. And the reason he's called a defiler is that arcane magic on Athos in the world of Dark Sun is powered by sucking the life out of the planet. <laughs> the best part about the description of the defiler class is that they're like, they're the, the, the group of people who doesn't care. They, they don't care about preserving life on Athos. They, they're basically like cynical. 
and they, they see Athos as doomed, and they're just going to suck what little life force is left in the pa planet out for their own means, right? This form of sorcery has an almost unlimited power level to it, depending on how much life you can suck out of the planet. And so this is what sort of has ravaged this world. Is magic is very powerful and also is using the planet as a battery. And so this planet is, is dying, basically. So really, those are the roots. Now, you also have like this sort of feudal culture. It's a slavery-driven culture. There's lots of slaves in, in Dark Sun. And, and the lords are holed up in these cities because there's these vast expanses of desert between the cities. And so the cities are very heavily defended and protected. Caravans are a, a really big ongoing theme because of the distances involved in Dark Sun. So in the book, the Sea of Silt is, you know, this endless ocean of dust, right? And in spots, it's hundreds of feet deep. It's just thin, it's just really fine dust. But you can move around using skiffs and using magic and other stuff. And the Sea of Silt is a nice story device because it lets you kind of do pocket adventures, kind of like the Black Ocean. Um, or even the Underdark has this kind of feel sometimes. It's kind of like several neat locations that are discreetly isolated from each other so you don't have to have too many ramifications as you're building your campaign. So the details of exactly what's in Dark Sun, I don't think are, even though they, they inspire me and they, they move me to create this whole style, you know, this like red stone and yellow dirt and this kind of eerie light that's casting the strange moons and like, as awesome as all that is, that still, to me, isn't what's so awesome about Dark Sun. So come on a little closer and let's really, let's really get into it. Hang on! Hang on, we're going for a ride! Whoa! Yeah, yeah. Actually, I rolled an eight. That's nothing to cheer about. Eight. You hit nothing. <laughs> okay, so if the actual sort of content or themes or story substance, or rules mechanics, or monster listings, or magic listings, or campaign details, or NPC stories. If those things aren't really the guts of why Dark Sun is so cool, well then why am I talking about it so much? Reason and the beauty of what gives Dark Sun its true sticking power and its true wonderment can take many different forms uh, in your game. And they don't have to be the form of Dark Sun. What's great about something like Dark Sun, whether it's exactly the world of Athos in your game, like played right out of the box, which would be great, or if you kind of find inspiration in the methods that they're using, the two book adventure method, the player aids, or maybe the way that they tailored the use of magic to their world, which I think is what Mark, Mike Merles was talking about when he commented on how cool Dark Sun is. Or maybe you tailor your races or your classes to the story of your world. That's also really cool. I think the, the thing that makes this exercise so awesome for your game is players get back to discovering. And I think it's something that is very easy to lose sight of in D&D. D&D &D is, is well known. Faerun is totally well known. Even to people who have never played D&D, &D, they know that there's orcs and that there's wizards in towers. And like when you see a weird glyph on the ground, it's probably something you're going to step on. They know that there's a locked door with a treasure chest and that like there's a tentacle. They know that people cast spells and that you know, like fighter guys are hard to kill. And like, they know all this stuff just because it's like, it's in the air, right? And it forms expectations. And as they're exploring their game, they sort of expect those things to be. They expect the familiar pillars of the genre to be there. But when you do a good job at world creation, at world building, as it is now affectionately known, a lot of that stuff is out the window. Every single moment is a new discovery for a player. Like, you know, what is that giant mouth opening in the ground, right? That's, what, that's not in any, I've never heard of that being in D&D. &D. It's just like, yeah, we're off the map as far as that goes, right? And, and I think this is what true world building is all about. And that's why Dark Sun 
is a masterclass. It isn't just put Dark Sun in your game. <laughs> no, it's see what they did. I see what you did there with Dark Sun and I want to do it. It's this feeling of discovering. Discovering your class. Discovering how magic works. Because it, work, it, now it works a totally different way. Oh, this is strange. I expected blah. But I got blah. Well, that's weird. What the hell is that thing? You know, like... Uh, you know, what goes on inside of the... Is this even a building or is this like a natural formation? Oh my god, Ant-Man! What's the culture of the Three Kreen like? Well, I guess you could do it, you know, like, well, they're like Klingons, of course, duh. No, or you could make it way weirder. They don't talk. They use pheromones to communicate and they, like, they build downward and I, I don't know. Things to turn expectations on their head and to do it in a huge, consistent way. That's world building. And you don't have to tell a bunch of big stories and write these all these arcs out and there's all this stuff going on and that's how I'm world building and so on and so forth. What I think Dark Sun can show you is that you can do that super effective world building with just a few key ideas. I think that studying Dark Sun is going to give you a sense of what the shortest possible list could be to do a kick-ass job constructing your your new homebrew world. Right? And to me, the most potent takeaway that you can get from Dark Sun is to go off the map, to, to be free. You don't have to be like, okay, well, in my world, there's this beholder and he's running around and he's got three dragons that are working for him and they're kind of on the sword coast and stuff. Actually, you're not world, build, world building at that point. You're just sort of storytelling within Feyrun or within sort of D&D common, right, would be a, a way to describe it. World building is what they said. They said, okay, there's a planet. There's no gods, for starters. Okay. So what are the ramifications of that? Blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's kind of, eh, that's all right. What else? Hmm. Well, none of the monsters that anyone knows about from D&D are in this world. Oh, man, that means we're going to have to make a bunch of monsters. Okay, cool, whatever, but at least I have my one bullet point. Not one single known monster. Okay, great. Hmm. What else? Well... Why are there no common monsters? Oh, I don't know. And what's the result of the gods being gone? Man, without gods, like, people start to suffer and things go bad. And, oh, see, so you, you tumble into Dark Sun or you tumble into this kind of thing. Or maybe you like a particular color palette. This is another thing that Dark Sun did. They said, I like orange, yellow, red. I like to think about a world in those colors. And then there's, like, black leather and there's very little metal. It's all stone and wood and stuff like that. Oh, and bone, and like, oh yeah, bone fits the color palette, and oh yeah, and the three cream have kind of like red, like the red ants. Oh man, yeah, I can see it in my head. That's cool. Maybe you like green. Maybe you like things that are like between yellow and green, and that's like vines and slime and uh, glowing green goo and like weird like magical forests, and maybe the opposite of Athos. It would be a a world overflowing with life force. Maybe that there's so much life force, it's actually trying to remove civilization. It's trying to overtake and cleanse itself of civilization, like the Genesis effect in Star Trek. <laughs> there's creative experiments to play with the idea of where you can go when you're world building, doing it the dark sun way. And then if you really want to freaking bring it home at the end, build yourself one of these visual aid decks. You can find stuff on the internet or whatever, but something to get on your table to remind your players what it looks like when you're fighting a three cream sorcerer. <laughs> Which just sit, having that sit there, it makes me think that's what this room design was. So originally I did this, this board as a Dark Sun board, and I have um, my Snoop Dogg demon here, and he's like, has these two like death serpents in these cages, and you come across him in the desert, and it turns out he's actually like worshiping these things. There's more of them, he's just like a low level priest who like is worshiping these death serpents and they're actually trying to make this black dragon rise up out of the sand that's been asleep because it's been contained by these weird like gold stone pylons and if you destroy the pylons then he can awaken but they're trying to build the power to destroy the pylons the, the, and then oh you discover there's a tribe of three cream who want to stop this because anytime the dragon awakens on Athos it's absolutely terrible it lays waste to entire cities so we have to stop this the dragon cannot awaken you learn this from this guy, probably wind up killing him. Then these two things come out of the cages. You go around, but then you find these. Spike bombs. They're about to use the spike bombs to blow up the pylons to release the dragon, but they only have two of them made. It takes them about a week to make one. So then not only do you have them, you have one on a wagon. Maybe you could transport this spike bomb to go blow up some enemies. 
Uh, maybe you just want to stay away from them. Maybe you need to go find who this guy's boss is. Maybe they have no supplies and they're really just here to get water. And then they want to keep going because they're going to meet this other guy who's at the far end of the Sea of Silt who actually knows a way to keep the dragon down for good. So even if they blow up the pylons, the dragon will stay asleep and will actually sink down into the core of Athos. Maybe there's another cult that believes that they can use the dragon to like heal the world. They can like use it like a giant sort of salve, you know, they're going to melt the dragon down and like inject it into the core of the world to like heal the magical energy that holds Athos together so it'll quit falling apart. Okay. Dark Sun is awesome. Look it up on Wiki, do your homework, but better yet, buy the box set. And it also is a great a way to look back at second edition. Still probably the edition I played the most in. Um, and just has a special place in my heart for the way that everything felt back then, the way the supplements felt, the way the storyline was going. And just obviously nostalgia because, I mean, that's when Star Trek Next Generation was on TV. Duh. Golden Age. Okay, I'm out of here, guys. Once I'm making sarcastic eyebrow motions, it's probably time to call the video. So I'm going to get out of here. Thanks for stopping in. I'm just like freaking out on Dark Sun. Try to catch up on my upcoming video. Um, it's going to be uh, another reading video, uh, book list for October of what I've been reading. And it includes Brahm's newest novel called Lost Gods, which is kind of like, uh, yes, Brahm, the artist from Dark Sun, also writes awesome books. And um, it's almost... It's, it's more of a journey through hell, but his hell is kind of a lot like Dark Sun. And you can actually see how his imagination has continued to build these themes. And they're great themes for a campaign world or for making an adventure or just dreaming up awesome badassery with cool stuff. Did that, any of that make sense? <laughs> this is weird over here. I don't like being over here. I feel funny. I don't feel like myself. I feel like you. Ah!